Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I think we're going to get started here. We were holding off. One of our commentators is, uh, shall we say, detained a little bit. So uh, we were giving him a little time. But, but he'll join us in just a minute, Santiago Canton. Thank you all for coming. Welcome to the Woodrow Wilson Center and the Mexico Institute. Uh, I also want to give a special word of welcome to the folks joining us on the World Wide Web, hundreds of millions of thousands of people <laughs> all over the world. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, and uh, we are delighted to have a program today on an issue that's particularly dear to my heart since I worked many years in the human rights community uh, here in Washington and with Mexico. So I'm, I'm very pleased to to be able to put together this panel on the topic of human rights in Mexico and the international community and its role in promoting human rights in Mexico. As you all know, you've read, if you've read any newspaper coverage in the last, oh, 20 years maybe, uh, <laughs> there's been a long brewing uh, conflict, frankly. I don't like to call it a war, but a conflict between uh, organized crime and drug traffickers in Mexico uh, and the government. Um, and uh, the Mexican government over the years has increasingly relied on the armed forces, the army and the, mil uh, and the marines in particular, to confront organized crime. Uh, and it's been a bloody and violent process. Um, and in that process of uh, moving, uh, using the armed forces uh, to confront organized crime, uh, there have been a dramatic increase in the reports of human rights violations, uh, human rights abuses against civilians uh, in Mexico. I think the data is pretty clear on that. The numbers of reported uh, or complaints filed between before the uh, National Human Rights Commission had been pretty high. Uh, and and in, there's been an ensuing debate about whether the military has a role to play uh, in confronting organized crime and drug trafficking in Mexico. Our goal here today is not to solve that debate. I think that's one that goes way beyond what we can discuss. But one of the debates or issues that's emerged in the context in that context has been who holds the military accountable when there are reports of uh, violations, when there are alleged human rights abuses. Under traditional legal frameworks in Mexico, the military has maintained uh, its right to investigate and hold uh, its own people accountable for those abuses. That tradition, that legal framework, runs up against a bigger and broader international framework, which generally, and I'll oversimplify here, uh, holds that civilian courts and jurisdictions should hold military people accountable when there are alleged human rights abuses. A, a very complex and difficult uh, debate anywhere uh, in the world, but being played out right now in Mexico. Uh, so we are delighted to have with us some of the leading experts on this, uh, these issues. Uh, and in particular, oh, welcome. <laughs> Just in time to be introduced. Um, we are particularly delighted to have with us today uh, uh, a Wilson Center public policy scholar, uh, uh, Alejandro Anaya, uh, who is here this summer working on a number of projects, um, but one uh, which deals with the issue of the international human rights frameworks and how that's had an impact on human rights practice in Mexico. And it has particular relevance to this issue of accountability for, in the military for human rights abuses. So we're thrilled to have Alejandro here. Alejandro is the coordinator for academic programs uh, at the Aguas Calientes campus for CIDE, the Center for uh, Research and Teaching in Economics, a very, uh, one of the leading public uh, universities in Mexico City and now with a campus in Aguas Calientes, uh, and he is the coordinator there. We're also joined, and I just wanted to 
highlight uh, uh, Mauricio Merino is also a public policy scholar here at the Wilson Center uh, working on accountability in government, uh, uh, not so much on the human rights side, but in public administration and those sorts of things, and also connected to CIDE, so we're glad to have you here. Um, and then uh, joining, Al Alejandro is going to make his presentation. He has a, a little PowerPoint. And then uh, after that, I've asked two very good friends, uh, leading lights in the human rights community in Washington, D.C., to offer commentary and their perspective as well. First, uh, Santiago Canton, a friend from many years, uh, a colleague at the or Organization of American States. He was the executive secretary of the Inter-American Commission for Human Rights at the OAS for 11 years, has recently moved uh, to the Robert F. Kennedy Center for Justice and Human Rights, uh, where he directs the RFK Human Rights Partners Program, but really one of the leading and foremost experts on the inter-American system for human rights, uh, both at the commission and also uh, what the inter-American court has done. So we're delighted to have you here. Thank you, Santiago. And then, uh, last but not least, a good friend and co-worker for many years, Ma I'm saying it in Spanish here, Maureen Meyer uh, from the Washington Office on Latin America, where she's the senior associate for Mexico programs, uh, has devoted uh, probably 10, 15 years of her life to human rights in Mexico, worked for a number of years in Mexico with one of the leading human rights organization, and at WOLA has really focused on the issue of human rights and the security situation in Mexico, uh, Medida Initiative, all these sorts of issues uh, in the bilateral agenda. So we'll start with Alejandro. Um, and, and then we'll ask uh, Santiago and Maureen to follow up with comments, and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, <clears throat> well, first of all, I would like to thank the Woodrow Wilson Center for having me here again as a public policy scholar. It's always a delight to spend a couple of months here uh, to focus on your work to get away from everyday teaching and uh, all the rest and uh, just have a few weeks locked up in your office writing. <laughs> so it's great. I'm, I'm thankful for, for this uh, opportunity, also, of course, for this presentation. I thank all of you to be, for being here, for taking interest in the, to in the subject, and of course, all the millions in the internet as well. <laughs> and uh, especially uh, Santiago and Maureen for agreeing also to make some comments on this uh, points on this talk I have uh, uh, prepared for, for today. This is uh, kind of two, what I'm going to present today are kind of two different but interrelated strands of my, of my work on human rights uh, in Mexico, and I'm going to try to, to put them together and see how it works. So as everybody knows, uh, President Calderón inserted in the fight against, I mean inserted the fight against drug cartels at the top of his government's agenda. And a key component of this strategy was, as just uh, uh, Eric mentioned, to strengthen the participation of the military in law enforcement actions in the country. A non-intended consequence of this militarization, however, has been a massive increase in the number of complaints regarding violations of human rights presumably perpetrated by members of the armed forces. This is also something that Eric already uh, underscored. Um, down there, there's, oh, there, there you go. Thank, um, you. thank you, Miguel. So in this framework, the violations of human rights that have been taking place in the struggle against drug cartels and the, puni the impunity around them have been the target of strong criticism from above. In other words, the human rights situation around the struggle against drug, uh, drugs in Mexico has been adopted by different transnational advocates of human rights, which have been ex exerting pressure over the Mexican government, trying to influence its policies, in particular those related to the participation of the armed forces in law enforcement activities and the use of the military jurisdiction to address cases of violations of human rights allegedly perpetrated by members of those uh, forces. 
So that's basically the first, the first point of, of my talk or the first question. You have all this, this, this pressure by different actors over the Mexican government and so at the end the question is if that has had an influence on behavior, if that has um, influenced the Mexican government and its actions, its policies. Of course, you know, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, the Washington Office for Latin America and other uh, non-governmental organizations working on human rights have persist persistently named and shamed Mexico because of the violations of human rights presumably perpetrated by security forces in the struggle against drugs. They included the situation in every year in the annual reports that they uh, issue. They published a number of special reports and they issue numerous press releases, open letters, and other advocacy documents. So that's mostly, more or less constant. Uh, uh, the publication of a report, the publication of a letter, the publication of a press uh, uh, report. And a central target of their activism has been the issue of impunity, which in their view is directly linked to the system of military jurisdiction. In addition, a number of human rights organs of the UN and the Inter-American Court of Human Rights have also given a lot of attention to the situation in Mexico, particularly after 2009. In that year, Mexico was examined through the Universal Periodic Review Mechanism of the Human Rights Council of the UN, which recommended that Mexico should reform its system of military jurisdiction. The Human Rights Committee and other human rights bodies of the UN did the same in 2010 and 2011 and also in these first uh, six, uh, seven, eight months of the year of 2012. A particularly important source of shaming has been the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, which in 2009 and 2010 adopted four different rulings in which it asked Mexico to get rid of military jurisdiction cases, I'm sorry, in cases of violations of human rights, presumably perpetrated by members of the armed forces. So there's been only six rulings of the Inter-American Court on Human Rights about Mexico, and, and four of them address the issue of military jurisdiction. A key question to ask is whether, or to what extent, NGOs and international bodies have been joined by governments of developed democracies, such as the US, in these shaming uh, actions. The literature has shown that pressure from other governments, particularly from developed democracies, is very important in transnational processes of naming and shaming. And of course, in the case of Mexico, a very important case in point is that of the US government, obviously. Throughout the Calderon years, the country reports on human rights practices of the Department of State have consistently reported the occurrence of executions, torture, forced disappearances, arbitrary detention, and illegal searches by the armed forces in the framework of the struggle against drug cartels. Furthermore, the Mexico country reports have pointed out that the system of military criminal justice has not delivered many convictions. However, the State Department reports use a very cautious language and avoid to explicitly criticize the Mexican government. On the other hand, as you all know, a key element of the bilateral agenda between Mexico and the U.S. during the Calderon period has been the Merida framework, which includes some human rights language and conditions. One of those conditions had to do, precisely, with the issue of military jurisdiction. They use, the U.S. Congress required that cases of the violation of human rights allegedly perpetrated by members of the armed forces should be prosecuted within the civil or ordinary system of criminal justice and not through military courts. However, in spite of the attempts by human rights organizations and some debate about it in Congress, to the best of my understanding, at the end of the day, no Merida funds have been withheld even if military jurisdiction has remained alive and healthy in Mexico throughout the Calderon period. In the same sense, far from supporting the use of sanctions against Mexico, the, the White House has clearly privileged security objectives over human rights in its bilateral diplomatic relations with Mexico. The statements of support to President Calderon and his security strategy has been, have been numerous, without uh, much consideration or much concern to its negative consequences in terms of human rights. 
at least in public diplomacy. Okay, uh, so that's what, what we have. And uh, 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 a following question to ask is what has been the reaction of the Mexican government to this growing but still moderate transnational human rights pressure? And I would like to underscore that the pressure is still moderate because there are no government actors taking part in that process of pressure. I've, I've made reference to the U.S., but we could say the same more or less about the European Union, for example, or Canada, or uh, any of these other uh, uh, global Good Samaritans. Uh, the Calderon government has strongly defended the participation of the armed forces in the struggle against drug cartels. Not even a program or a schedule to progressively replace the military by police forces has been granted. The government discourse about military jurisdiction, however, has changed. In 2009, the government staunchly defended military jurisdiction. By late 2010, however, it had sent to Congress a reform bill that proposed that cases of torture, rape, and forced disappearances that involved members of the armed forces should be prosecuted within the civil or ordinary system of penal justice. Even if this reform bill was severely criticized by human rights NGOs and human rights organizations in general in Mexico and abroad, it did send a signal of a change of discourse. In December 2011, in December 10, 2011, the date of the anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and in the context of the National Human Rights Prize Ceremony, President Calderón stressed that his government intended to push forward the reform to the system of military jurisdiction, and he publicly instructed the Attorney General's Office and the Ministries of Defense and the Navy to find a way to, in the absence of a reform, transfer all cases of alleged violations of human rights perpetrated by members of the armed forces to the civilian system of criminal justice. So that was a public speech. At the moment, however, no reform has been passed in Congress and the Attorney General's Office, the Ministers of Defense, and the Navy have not done much to carry out the President's instructions in practice. Indeed, and I quote Human Rights Watch here, cases of alleged military abuses against civilians are still routinely investigated in military jurisdiction, and the military has challenged cases in which civilians have petitioned for investigations of abuses to be transferred from military to civilian courts. End of the quote. The debate in the Senate regarding the reform to the system of military jurisdiction intensified in recent months. Senatorial commissions approved a new version of the bill, different to that originally presented by President Calderon, which establishes that all cases, all cases of violations of human rights allegedly perpetrated by members of the armed forces will be prosecuted in federal civil courts, and that conflicts of, juris of jurisdiction between military and civilian courts would be decided by the National Supreme Court. This is just, this is a bill approved in commissions, it's not, it's not law yet. Apparently, other proposals, less acceptable to national and international advocates of human rights, were also on the table. And the opinion of Human Rights Watch and the pressure by civil society organizations in general helped to switch the scale in favor of the bill that was finally approved in the commissions of the Senate. In sum, in the midst of growing international pressure, the government's position on military jurisdiction did change, even if only discursively. Somehow, President Calderon has been pushed towards at least pretending to favor a reform in this, on this delicate issue, presumably much to the position of the armed forces themselves. Furthermore, it seems that the pressure exerted by international actors, such as Human Rights Watch and the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, has influenced debate in the Mexican Senate and, as I will mention shortly, in the National Supreme Court regarding a reform to the system of, Mexican, of, of military jurisdiction. In this way, a significant reform seems to be more likely now than two or three years ago. And it seems that transnational human rights pressures are part of the explanation. Transnational human rights pressure have not ended the violations of human rights taking place in the struggle against drug cartels. But they have been a very important force in the, in the redefinition of the rules that define state-society relations around these issues. So I guess that's one of my main points. 
But the more important changes in this respect seem to be coming from the National Supreme Court, not from the government that feels the pressure from above. And this is just a very recent development in the last few days. As you know, in the past few days, the Supreme Court adopted two very important decisions and is actually debating now a third one. And in these two other decisions, it has ruled that two specific cases of alleged violations of human rights perpetrated by the armed forces have to be taken to the ordinary system of criminal justice. This is an important breakthrough. Putting aside the fact that the civil system of criminal justice is not guaranteed for much anyway in Mexico, what is relevant for this presentation is that it seems that change in the system of military jurisdiction is coming through the judicial power, not through the actions of the executive or the, leg of the legislative powers. And it is important to note that the Supreme Court has not been the main target of transnational activism. They do interact with them and meet with them, but the main target of transnational activism are generally uh, executive powers. I do not know if this, if, if this means something uh, has to change in the way that transnational advocates operate in relation to Mexico. But, the, but this is something that we can get back to in the Q&A uh, sessions. For the moment, let me change the subject, the subject a little bit and talk about the other line of research that I mentioned. Up to this point, I have followed, let me say, a traditional human rights approach, one that focuses on the violations of human rights perpetrated by agents of the state. But I would also like to discuss from a human rights perspective the overall situation of drug-related violence in Mexico, the daunting atrocities perpetrated by organized crime. Thousands of people are being denied their right to life, physical integrity, and liberty. And the main source of this massive infringement on human rights is a brutal war between drug cartels and, in general, the criminal activity conducted by non-state actors. Since 2008, murder rates in Mexico escalated back to the levels of the early 1990s. The recent peak in murder rates in Mexico coincides with an, increasing, with an increase in drug-related violence and the so-called war against drugs. According to official figures, nearly 50,000 people were killed in drug-related violence during the first five years of the Calderón government. Uh, so they say that it's around 60 now. Though there are no systematic data on the use of torture in the context of drug-related violence, journalistic accounts suggest that executions by drug cartels are often preceded by torture. A search of news reports in leading Mexican newspapers that contain the term uh, cadaver, corpse, and the term tortura, torture, published in a period of five years, produces a list of 274 news stories. So all these press reports talking about torture before execution. So even if we lack a more detailed and systematic account of on the occurrence of torture and its relation to executions within the framework of drug-related violence, there is enough evidence to determine that it is also an important part of the picture. This scenario is further complicated by the occurrence of disappearances also perpetrated by organized crime within the framework of drug-related violence. According to local human rights NGOs, about 3,000 people disappeared in the country between 2007 and 2011. The National Commission on Human Rights, however, reported that the number uh, reached nearly 5,500, while other sources claim that up to 10,000 people have gone missing during the government of, Pel of Felipe Calderón. Again, even if we lack systematic data, it is, clear, it is clear that disappearances further aggravate the situation of massive and systematic violation of physical integrity rights in Mexico. Many of these victims are children. There are some reports on that or some research on that. Thousands of those affected are poor migrants from Central America, men and women and children on the route to the U.S., uh, well, this situation in which thousands of people are being denied the enjoyment of their physical integrity rights develops and flourishes in the midst of blatant impunity. The direct victims of violence and their families seldom receive any kind of reparation or compensation. 
Executions that are considered by the authorities as resulting from inter-cartel inter fighting are not investigated. The National Commission on Human Rights asserted in October 2011 that nearly 9,000 bodies have not been identified. According to some journalistic estimates, only 5% of drug-related murders are investigated. This coincides with academic research on overall impunity in Mexico, which has estimated that only 4.5% of crimes are investigated by prosecutors, while only 1.6% of these cases, somebody is taken to trial. And then at the end of the day, only 0.8% uh, end up in prison or something like that. The uncontrolled wave, uh, wave of drug-related violence in Mexico has generated a severe crisis of physical integrity rights in the country. Perhaps the worst, the worst since, the nine, uh, since the 1910 Mexican Revolution. Tens of thousands of people have been denied the right to life during the Calderon government, while an undetermined number have been tortured or disappeared. However, this situation has not been understood within a human rights framework and not by the uh, government, not by the population in general, and to some degree not even by the transnational advocates of human rights. As already suggested, uh, transnational advocates have focused more on the traditional violations of human rights, that is those, those perpetrated by state agents. It has been um, strongly argued by academics, activists, and international human rights organs that the actions of non-state actors can be considered as entailing human rights responsibilities for states or even constitute violations of human rights by themselves. And it has also been argued that given the decrease in power of many states vis-a-vis -vis other actors, such as multinational corporations, international financial institutions, terrorist groups, and rebel or insurrection movements, the negative effects on human rights of the actions of non-state actors is one of the most, um, I'm sorry, um, one of the most critical human rights matters of our time, and that's a quote from the academic literature. One of the most critical human rights matters of our time. But going, at, going back to Mexico, the perpetrators of the massive amount of abuses against physical integrity rights are members of a particular kind of non-state actor that has not been associated before the, with, the violations, with the violation of human rights in the past, that is organized crime, and more specifically drug cartels. The literature of non-state actors generally refer to the actors that I just mentioned, multinational corporations, international financial institutions, rebel groups, insurgent movements, but not about drug cartels. So that is a challenge. Uh, nevertheless, the argument of state responsibility could be made, even if the perpetrators are not are non-state actors. The situation could be framed by transnational advocates as one of the violation of human rights, not so much by non-state actors themselves, but by the Mexican state. Even if the bulk of the executions, torture, and disappearances are perpetrated by members of organized crime, there is evidence that shows that state agents are sometimes, or many times, directly or indirectly involved. This is the mod to which Javier Sicilia makes reference to. You, you, don't, you can tell it's all so muddy that you can tell who is who. Uh, in these kind of cases, the direct responsibility of the state could be easily presented in front of larger audiences. But the main argument that could be uh, made is that of diagonal obligations, diagonal obligations. That is, the obligations of the state derived from the actions of non-state actors. Transnational advocates of human rights could stress that the Mexican state is utterly failing to act with due diligence in order to control violence and to prevent the occurrence of executions, torture, and disappearances. In other words, they could stress that the state is failing to protect, to protect thousands of people, and thus <laughs> failing to ensure or secure the enjoyment of their physical integrity rights. This framing exercise could be buttressed, making reference to the relevant international norms. 
Indeed, international human rights instruments, such as the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the American Convention on Human Rights, explicitly establish the duty of diligent prote protection of rights. Furthermore, the duty to protect, or the obligation, I should say, the obligation to protect physical integrity rights against attacks by private actors has been explicitly made by the Human Rights Committee of the UN and by the Inter-American Court of Human Rights presumably also the Inter-American Commission, I wouldn't know. <laughs> this could be linked to the situation of blatant impunity around drug-related violence. Passive or active omission produces an unden undeniable failure to conduct effective investigations, bring those responsible to justice, and provide remedy and compensation to the victims. In this way, there is sufficient evidence as to also frame the situation as one of denial of the right to access to justice which in turn fits into the vicious cycle in which executions, torture, and disappearances by non-state actors take place. In sum, the severe situation of violence faced by Mexico could be understood in terms of human rights and inspire or animate a transnational human rights campaign. It could be a source of further human rights pressure of, over Mexico. But of course, this is uh, uh, not taking place until now, at least. And I guess that my point is that it probably should. Well, we can follow up this discussion and reflect around the reasons for why transnational advocates haven't taken up this issue, uh, at least not at the core of their agenda, if you want, in the Q&A sessions. But for the moment, I will just leave it here. Thank you, Eric. Thank you very much. That's terrific. Thanks so much. Um, Okay, we'll uh, ask Santiago Canton, and I want to emphasize again, he's not here speaking for the Inter-American Commission. That's a former post he had, but here uh, as part of the Robert F. Kennedy Center for Human Rights. Thank you very much, Eric, and <clears throat> thank you, Alejandro, for your, your presentation. Is this working? Yeah. yeah. Um, sorry to arrive late, but as a matter of fact, I arrived like 15 minutes before I reached here, but it took me 15 minutes to cross the building and, uh, <laughs> and get to this place. So. Um, yeah, I, I, I do. Uh, I believe that the issue presented by Alejandro is probably one of the m most uh, challenging issues in in uh, in Latin America these days. You know what's going on in Mexico regarding and I wouldn't hesitate to call it a uh, human rights, uh, uh, very difficult situation for human rights in Mexico. I don't, uh, I think it is uh, uh, fair to say already, I don't think we need to keep going you know, around the bushes to to, uh, to clearly say that uh, there is a serious problem for human rights in Mexico over the last few years. Um, I'd like to uh, uh, raise two issues uh, on regarding what Alejandro was uh, referring to. The first one is, I do believe that there is an issue of military jurisdiction that we need to discuss, and also there is an issue of, um, of uh, what, what is the state responsibility regarding the human rights uh, violations of the organized crime. But before that, I think there is an, an issue, there is a question of should the military be involved at all in the uh, in the war against drugs, and I think that should be part of the of the discussion as well. Uh, needless to say, Latin America has a very tragic history of uh, military involvement in internal affairs. Uh, if you go to the southern cone and, and you see what was the role of the military in, in Latin America, S same in Central America, and whenever the military gets involved into issues which are uh, internal affairs issues immediately a yellow light turns on in every case. It doesn't mean that automatically, automatically there are going to be human rights violations, but very likely uh, there's going to be human rights violations, and we are seeing that in the, case, uh, in the case of Mexico. So the first question we need to ask, and that's something to, to discuss, is whether or not the military should be involved at all. Uh, I'm not naive. I know that we are facing, uh, Mexico is facing a, a very serious and difficult challenge. Um, you have uh, organized crime that is probably is better armed sometimes than the, than the government, but uh, the issue needs to be discussed. We cannot just assume that the military has to be involved in the, uh, in the fight against, uh, against uh, in the war against drugs. And 
if it is involved, there should be a very clear control by the, by the, uh, by the government, by the democratic elected authorities, uh, with very strict rules, and I don't think that's happening. So that, that's the, one of the first, you know, before we go to the issue of you know, how, whether the militaries are responsible or not for human rights violations or what to do and what should be the, uh, should the military jurisdiction or the civilian jurisdiction, the first question we need to ask is whether the military should be involved and if the, uh, and if the decision is that they should be involved in, in, what capacity, in what capacity and what is the control that the government should have over the activity of the military. That's the first, the first question and again, I'm just raising this issue as a comment to Alejandro's presentation, and uh, hopefully we can discuss this uh, furthermore in, in the Q&As. Uh, the other one is the <coughs> military jurisdiction. The Inter-American System for Human Rights, both at the Commission and the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, have for more than a decade, I, here I have Christina Serna, she can uh, uh, refresh my memory, but definitely probably two decades already. Yeah. Uh, that uh, stating that uh, the, uh, the, the, mi the military jurisdiction is not accepted for human rights violations, period. That's very clear. There's no question about it. Uh, probably the first case was uh, 2000, maybe, Christina, the first case that that was decided uh, by the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. The Commission had decided that before. So there's no question about it. That, that's, that's the rule, and that should be applied, and it was applied in some cases. I mean, there are good examples on of uh, how um, military justice was transformed, was changed because of the decision of the inter-American system, and hopefully that will happen in the case of Mexico as well. Uh, there is even the case of uh, Argentina in which the Argentine government got rid of the military code uh, because of, uh, of uh, work in the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. So. Uh, we know now that the uh, Supreme Court of Mexico is taking this, uh, these decisions. There has been already a, a few very good decisions of the Supreme Court of Mexico. Uh, there's, there's need to have three or more decisions, I believe, according to Mexican law, in order to make this as a, as a rule that have to be followed by every judge in Mexico. Uh, it's going to that direction. We all hope that it's going to maybe this week, maybe next week, uh, that uh, that amount of cases are going to be decided in order to make it a, a rule in Mexico to uh, prohibit <coughs> military jurisdiction for cases of human rights violations. The other issue that is being discussed by the Supreme Court that is extremely important as well, and for what we have heard uh, is not necessarily going in the right direction, is uh, the right of the victims of human rights violations to have a to have a, a recourse, to have a, a, a possibility to presenting a complaint for human rights violations. Right now has been a question mainly of competence between federal justice and, and military justice, but uh, the issue of uh, the right of the victims of human rights violations to present a recourse is under discussion as well. And again, the inter-American system also there, both at the commission and at the court, have insisted on the fact that the, the victim should have a right in all these cases, so we hope, we hope that what we have heard is not correct and that the Supreme Court of Mexico will rule as well in this case, in these cases that uh, the, the victim should have a, a right uh, by themselves uh, to, to reach the Supreme Court. Um, so I, you know, the issue of military justice, uh, there's no, there shouldn't be much more discussion, it's just a question of the Mexican government following up on the decision of the inter-American system, as, 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 as other governments have uh, done it. Uh, so hopefully in the next few weeks, that's going to be resolved. Uh, but again, still remain the first question I, I made at the beginning of my presentation, whether the military should be involved at all or not. The other one is state responsibility for uh, human rights violations of uh, non-state actors. And again there, um, uh, the inter-American system, uh, both the commission and the court have uh, said in many cases already that uh, there is state responsibility for the violation of uh, non-state actors. Cases of the param paramilitary in Colombia are uh, probably four or five cases already by the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, more cases at the Commission that have, uh, have uh, uh, find that the Colombian government was uh, responsible, internationally responsible for human rights violations committed by paramilitary officers because there was a clear link 
between the, the activity of the paramilitary and government agents. So the importance in those cases is to, to prove the connection between government agents and, and, and these other groups. And uh, very likely, again, this, uh, this Mexican Supreme Court have opened the door to international human rights like, uh, like never before. So we expect that uh, hopefully in the future, again, also the Supreme Court of Mexico will find responsibility for, of the state of Mexico for violations if that link is proved. And um, that's a nice music. Somebody <laughs> have a phone on? <laughs> um, and then the issue of, uh, that also Alejandro mentioned, uh, the issue of uh, due diligence in all these cases, uh, what is important, and the, again, I insist, uh, both the Commission and the Court, and I was asked to refer to the Commission and the Court, it's not that I'm a fan, although I am a fan, <laughs> I'm not doing it, uh, uh, because what I was asked to refer to it, again, the, the Inter-American system, has referred to the issue of due diligence in many cases, both in the cases of uh, 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 the paramilitary cases of Colombia, but also in cases of uh, domestic violence, uh, is the issue of uh, due diligence, the cases in which has uh, uh, been, been used the, the, you know, the due diligence, due diligence uh, principle more often than, than in other cases. And uh, at the end of the day is the the due diligence of the government to avoid these violations to happen, or if they don't avoid the violations to happen, to make sure that they are investigated. And that, as Alejandro showed, is one of the major problems in Mexico, impunity uh, for human, bio, human rights violations uh, are, um, I wouldn't say worse than other countries. They might be, but in, in general in Latin America, the impunity for human, human rights violations is pretty bad in general. Um, so hopefully, again, with the current decision of the, inter uh, the Supreme Court of Mexico, that's going to be changed. I'm not, and I'm not referring only to the decisions taking uh, place right now in Mexico by the Supreme Court. Uh, a few months ago, there have been uh, other decisions of the Supreme Court of Mexico that basically have, uh, have ruled that all the judges in Mexico will have to use international standards of human rights in their own internal decisions. That is something that's going to change in the long term, we are not. We cannot uh, see. We are not going to see a change in the next months or so. But uh, the Mexican government uh, started a, a process by because of this decision of the Supreme Court to train all the judges in Mexico. And you can guess that there are a lot of judges in Mexico, so that's going to take a lot of time uh, to train them on international human rights standards. So they apply that internally. And that's going to be a significant change if that process continues. If the gov government, called the, pr the presidency of Calderon, they started to do this, uh, to follow up on this uh, Supreme Court decision by starting to train the lawyers, hopefully that's going to continue with the next with the next government. At the end of the day, I would say that as it is the case in Mexico and, and many other countries in in Latin America, I will finish with two things. Uh, <coughs> The military's uh, role in internal security. Someone can argue that these are uh, this, uh, that these are not the typical cases of internal security, I, 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 and I accept that. But still, we are talking about issues in which the militaries in Latin America, as well as in other places in the world, are trained not to prevent violations. The police is trained to prevent violations. The military is not trained to prevent violations. And once you have the military involved, you can at least, as I said at the beginning, be concerned because uh, the experience of Latin America has been tragic in that aspect. Uh, and the second one is impunity, which is an eternal problem that uh, many countries have in, in Latin America, particularly when it comes to issues of human rights uh, violations. And, we, and there have been very good changes in, in some countries over the last few years. And we expect that the uh, changes <coughs> that are taking place in Mexico through the Supreme Court of Mexico uh, will eventually start uh, to change the pattern of impunity regarding human rights violations in Mexico. So with that, Eric, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Alejandro, for your presentation. And I'd like to you know, participate in the Q&A. Thanks. Thank you.
Okay, and uh, finally, we'll uh, hear from uh, Maureen Meyer, Senior Associate for Mexico at the Washington Office on Latin America. Thank you, Eric, and thanks to the Mexico Institute for putting this panel together and for the invitation to comment on Alejandro's work. I must say I've been a subject of his uh, research in the past, so it's nice to, to actually be on the, at the table with him. Um, and, and I do think, you know, WOLA as an organization has certainly ha um, expressed our concern about a long-term involvement of the Mexican military in counter-drug operations and public security in general and about the use of military jurisdiction uh, for human rights violations against um, the civilian population. But I wanted to focus my comments more on the second part of Alejandro's um, presentation of what does it mean right now to defend human rights in Mexico or, or being an organization based here internationally that's looking at the human rights situation in Mexico in the current context. I think it's something that as an organization we've struggled with looking at how do you address organized crime as a human rights, or, um, human rights issue what has been the changes in the types of human rights violations that are happening? What are the risks for security in the current context? So kind of a little bit focused on that current defending human rights in this current situation in, in Mexico. And I think in terms of more the traditional human rights violations committed by state actors, certainly it's already um, been discussed. We've seen the huge increase in abuses and complaints. Uh, the Mexican Human Rights Commission has documented a five-fold increase in complaints against the military and federal police since 2006, and I think it's worth talking about the types of cases. It's torture, rape, extrajudicial execution, arbitrary detention, and forced disappearances, among other abuses. And at the same time, the commission had, had stated recently that of the cases it documented in 2010 and 2011, no police or soldier had been sanctioned for these abuses. So I think you certainly see that ongoing impunity. The same could be said for about the, the cases that have gone before the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, that in spite of sentences against the Mexican state, none of the, the cases actually seen an effective prosecution of, and in those cases, the soldiers that were involved in the human rights violations. And yet all of this work is being done, one, in a context of certainly extreme violence and brutality in Mexico. And I think one of the big challenges has been highlighting these horrific abuses that are by state agents, the, the acts of torture, detentions, um, disappearances, without oh, not, and making sure that's not necessarily overshadowed by what we would see as brutal criminal acts by organized criminal groups or just criminal groups in general. A lot of times it has, that situation has overshadowed human rights work. I think we've even had questions of, well, what do you say about the torture being committed by organized crime? And I think that is, it is a challenge of how do you address that but not take away state responsibility for its own police and military that are also committing these types of acts. And at the same time, I think the context in Mexico has served almost as a, an excuse for human rights violations to occur. Um, of the cases that the Supreme Court is actually looking at in Mexico in the past few days, one involves military planting marijuana on citizens. I think, again, it's that looking for an excuse to detain someone. The case being discussed today is about an indigenous who was um, shot and killed while his bus was leaving a military checkpoint, and soldiers originally tried to plant marijuana on the bus as well as a way to kind of um, justify their actions. Even if you look at the, the, the system of arraigo in Mexico, which is allows um, uh, police to detain suspects for up to 80 days if they're accused of organized crime while they gather evidence against them. It's actually pre-accusation detention. There's been massive accusations of torture in that context. So again, human rights violations that are used within that context of organized crime looking for what you know, suspects or people to be accused of these types of crimes. And I think it's also, um, you know, the organized crime situation in Mexico has also served as an excuse by the Mexican government to not investigate cases. We're talking about estimates of 95% of all homicides aren't being effectively investigated, so you're really not sure even what, who's involved or who's responsible for most of these um, acts. I think, as Alejandro mentioned, and looking at the international level from our point of view, this has been a challenge with our work on U.S. policy. Uh, we've seen the U.S. Congress place conditions on U.S. assistance through the Merida Initiative. We've also seen the U.S. Congress, particularly in the House, recently try to take those conditions away, I think, in the sense that there's an urgency of supporting Mexico's security efforts. We don't want to stall that, so there's certainly been that kind of challenge of addressing human rights in this context. There's also been, as Alejandro mentioned, two favorable reports from the State Department on Mexico meeting the human rights requirements in the Merida Initiative in spite of the fact that I think our organizations and many others have certainly documented what we would consider the failure to meet those requirements or the State Department's own human rights report, their annual report on Mexico this year, 
concluding that there is a continued widespread impunity for human rights abuses committed by the military and the police. Um, that said, I think the issue of organizations, what do you do in this current context? Because it is where you see massive, brutal acts being committed by the you know, civilian population and not necessarily ones that fit within the traditional human rights framework. And I think on that, as Alejandro mentioned, you have the issue of disappearances. We have spoken with organizations in northern Mexico, human rights organizations that are documenting 40 cases a week of disappearances, and yet they certainly are aware of Maybe a fraction of the cases you can say, yes, there's state agents involved. A lot of them we're not sure, and some of them certainly are just linked to organized crime. That doesn't stop them from documenting the cases. Like there is that big demand, or you have these victims that are recurring to human rights organizations as what they would view as their only kind of recourse to denounce things, and yet these situations don't always fit within the, the traditional framework. The same with the kidnapping of migrants in, in Mexico. I think that is another area where you have seen certainly complicity by state agents in certain several cases or active involvement in it. But where there's, cert I think, and that I would say there's been probably more and more outcry both from the national human rights community in Mexico and even internationally on the, this crisis and not only pressing for investigations of state agents involved in abuses, but certainly looking to press on third actors, so non-state actors being involved in these human rights violations. I do think, though, at the same time, human rights violations that we would all consider that used to be more clean, clear cut or straightforward aren't this, it's not the same situation now in Mexico. I can put forth <coughs> cases we've heard of where you have investigative police that have tortured a suspect into confessing um, or signing a confession, and yet that person isn't just a police agent. He works for an organized criminal organization. And I think that is one of the most complicated factors for human rights work right now in Mexico is that you don't just have the state violating human rights. You also have state agents that are working for the state but also working for organized criminal groups. And what does that mean in terms of denouncing cases, in terms of cases not moving forward? Organizations have certainly said, we know of certain times when we've submitted complaints and they don't go anywhere because there's other powers that are behind, you know, pushing for those cases to not move forward. I think the same where there's been attempts to lodge a complaint about a federal police officer, for example, and the mini public ministry won't accept it because they say, we are too concerned about your own safety. I'm not going to take this information because I think there certainly is that police invasion involvement, but also the organized criminal element that makes it much more complex. And I think that's the, the third area of what is the implications for defending human rights in Mexico right now, and what is the role of the international community in working with human rights defenders in Mexico? I think the, the amount of threats and attacks against human rights defenders has certainly increased substantially in the past few years, and I think a lot due to these this context of organized crime. Um, just the past few months, there have been two human rights defenders that left the country temporarily. Both are now back in Mexico, but both working in states and in contexts where it's very clear that there is that organized criminal element around their work. And I think that, again, it's not just denouncing the state anymore. There is that other like third actor or third party involved that makes it very difficult for these organizations to both do their work but then have decide what to do with the type of information they do have on what's happening in, in the country. And I think that is something that WOL as an organization and others are struggling with of how do you work and help these organizations both in terms of their own safety but also in terms of processing this current situation. I think the number of abuses and what's happening certainly overwhelms a lot of the organizations and there hasn't been that kind of time to really reflect on the implications of the current situation for the defense of human rights and for their own safety. Safety just both for defenders but also for the victims. And I think that is something that we haven't um, really come to terms with yet or fully figured out how to address. And so I do think that right now, um, as we've all said, there's the over and overarching issue of impunity in Mexico, both for what we would consider traditional human rights violations but also then these brutal acts that are not being investigated by the state. And so finding the appropriate balance and role for human rights organizations in keeping up the pressure on states' direct responsibility for investigating these cases, but also then looking at the broader issues of impunity and the lack of justice in Mexico. And I think that's where, again, this, they, there is that emerging, I think, work and more needs to be done to sort of ex continue exercise pressure on the Mexican government of these horrific acts that are occurring that aren't just shouldn't be just overlooked because they're criminal acts, but are certainly affecting people's basic rights. 
Thank you so much, uh, Maureen. Um, sure, why not? Right. Yeah. I think what our speakers have made very clear is that um, this issue of human rights in the context of uh, confronting organized crime opens up a wide variety of complex issues, both in terms of accountability between military and civilian jurisdictions and court systems and justice systems, but also how one defines human rights uh, more broadly in the context of, of extreme violence and criminal actions and criminal violence. Um, kind of makes you reminiscent of the good old days of human rights violations in the Southern Cone where it was more clean and clear and it was, all this stuff was more easily identifiable. But I think it's a wonderful, uh, interesting uh, challenge for all of us to, to struggle with because I think it uh, has real impact on, on people and humans and their lives. Um, okay, we have time. We have about 35 minutes, I believe, for some questions. I would ask you to raise your hand, uh, be concise, wait for uh, uh, the mic to arrive so that folks that are with us on the internet can hear your question, um, and be polite. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so we have a question here mid-table, and we have qu two questions here, so we'll go in that order. Three, three okay, three. But let's start here mid-table, and then Aurelia will pass you the phone. Hi, thanks very much for your presentation. Could you just tell us, yeah, identify yourself so that we all... Yeah, my name is Stephen Lurie. I'm with the Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Law. And um, I'm interested with, uh, with how we can address the issues of human rights violations from perhaps a preventive uh, standpoint. Because in addressing issues of impunity, it seems that it is quite responsive, right? Once these violations have occurred, how can we investigate and prosecute them? Uh, I'm wondering particularly if there is any possibility, uh, particularly in relation to Mr. Cantone's statement that military is not trained to prevent violations, if there is a possibility for the Mexican military to have human rights or international humanitarian law training, and if there is that training and if there's a possibility for that training, would it be effective in preventing human rights violations? Should we take more? Yeah, okay, I, there's three questions, so I don't want to go, yeah, go ahead. Yolanda Sanchez, International Trade and Communications Corporation. I think that Maureen raised a very important question. The drug dealers are killing each other very brutally. Now, what is your role, just denouncing or defending? How can, you, how can any defend the most hated people in the world? Christina Sterner with the George Washington University Law School. Um, I have two questions, comments. Uh, the first is, I came because of the, um, these incredible actions by the Mexican Supreme Court, and I was hoping that the discussion would be exclusively on that, so I hope it could be followed up uh, maybe by another panel just dealing with that, uh, that matter. My, my question is really, how do you deconstruct this? In, on uh, July 11th, I believe, or July 7th, 2011, the Mexican Supreme Court issued what were the criteria for deciding what were the obligations of the state in uh, complying with the Radia Pacheco case, which was a forced disappearance case involving military jurisdiction. Is, is the court today, when it's dealing with these concrete cases, bound by that decision from 2011? Uh, or is it creating the jurisprudence ab initio right now? And how many cases? I think Santiago hinted that you have to have three, five, five. cases five. to create jurisprudence. If, if that could be explained a little further. Three more. <laughs> 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 Thank you. <laughs> and my, my second uh, comment is on the non-state actors' responsibility. There is a very interesting report by the Special Rapporteur on Counterterrorism, Ben Emerson, that was presented this summer to the UN Human Rights Council, in which in two paragraphs he stated that uh, states should recognize that non-state actors 
commit human rights violations. Unfortunately, nobody, none of the states, none of the NGOs asked him, well, how do you do that since human rights treaties only find states responsible? But I think, especially in, in the situation of international, or in the, in the situation of armed conflict, not international armed conflict, but in the situation of armed conflict since international humanitarian law holds uh, non-state actors responsible, that there is beginning to be, at least at the UN level, through UN Security Council resolutions, attempts to hold non-state actors equally responsible with states for atrocities. Uh, it's being done in a political sense, not in a legal sense, but I think it's a very interesting development. Hi, <coughs> my name is Howard Wooldridge. I'm a co-founder of LEAP, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. I'm a retired police detective from Fort Worth. Um, my fear in this conference is that unless we shut down the fountain, the source of these human rights violations, which come principally from the drug cartels in Mexico now going into Guatemala and Honduras, that if we, if we simply uh, focus on the human rights violations, what can we do about them now, that we can have a conference in five or 10 years and be exp uh, doing the exact same thing with tens of thousands of more victims. My question is, are the groups that are engaged in the human rights violations in Mexico and beyond, are they also pressuring the appropriate governments, people, whatever, to end the policy of American war on drugs, drug prohibition, in order to, to eliminate the source of so many violations of human rights with the drug dealer killing drug dealer, the, all the others. From testimony that I've seen, uh, the cartels derive about 75% of their, their uh, uh, operating uh, funds from the drug prohibition part of it. If we shut that down, we could perhaps eliminate 75% of all the human rights violations. Thank you. Um, do you want to start, Alejandro, and we'll just work our way down? Okay. Thank you. Thank you all for your comments, uh, questions. Uh, a quick word about the training and the, and the prevention. There's a lot of training. Mm -hmm. There's been years and years of, tra of training for everyone, and uh, you can see that in the reports of, of, of uh, and the speeches of the Mexican government time and again. And I, I, I really don't think I've been I've been I've been a trainer in those training courses, and I, I'm sure they don't work. I'm sure they don't work. Uh, how do you prevent? Uh, so yeah, so I think that best way to prevent is to show that the system works, and if, and, you have, and that if you do something, then you will get punished for it. So it goes back to impunity. I think that that is. Um, I think that is the key. Uh, now a great question is is if can you really have a good shot at defending a bad guy? No? Well, probably a first question is if you should, but <laughs> let's say that's grand that you say, yeah, we should. I mean, even if he's a criminal, he is, he, probably his family has the right to know what happened to him. Or probably, he, you know, uh, many of these bad guys in Mexico are just young people without no options at all, but to get engaged in what they do, get engaged. So uh, can you blame them so? Just, just so harshly in terms of, you know, he had it coming, he is getting involved with it, so that was his choice. How free was that choice in a context of severe economic deprivation in which the only routes for social mobility are perhaps being, uh, and where there is also a very strong culture of, of narco uh, praise. You know, all these corridos, all these, all these songs, folk songs that praise and tell the stories of this poor guy in the mountain that is now so powerful and rich and so on. So you have all these young people in Mexico, the f famous ninis, I don't know if you are familiar with the term, ni estudian, ni trabajan, yeah? So you have a legions, legends, uh, how you say it? legiones, yeah, legions? Legions. Legions of people there. So anyway, if you say we should even defend these bad guys, uh, uh, Another question is how good of a chance I have to defend them uh, successfully because mm, internationally they are not going to drown sympathy. Yeah? So the most effective or successful human rights campaign focuses on women and children, groups that are easily presented as vulnerable and innocent. So that's a huge challenge. I mean, I didn't mention in the presentation, but it, I do 
mentioned it in my larger research, that this is a very bad case for a human rights transnational campaign because it's difficult to present this uh, or many of the victims as vulnerable or, and innocent. Um, I don't know a lot about the, 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 I'm not a lawyer, so I couldn't answer your, 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 your question. Uh, but yeah, you need five cases to make jurisdiction, but I know, I don't know how the 2011 ruling, that's the question I have. Uh, what's the role of that previous ruling? Because if it had uh, uh, an important or a, or a key role, then why, uh, why are they discussing that again now? No? Um, and uh, uh, yeah, there's, a, there's some debate in Mexico. Some people in Mexico are talking about prohibition and uh, well, basically legalization. There are some scholars that are discussing this but they are on the margins and uh, basically nobody listens to them. And, uh, but there's been an important, there was an important, there's been important changes. I mean, uh, important former presidents are now advocating legalization. President Calderon was adamant to even say, but he did at the end say, well, we could discuss it. And uh, in the current elections, no, in the, well, in the, in the uh, electoral competition, all the candidates just oh, very skillfully try to avoid that one. And, um, but it has a very difficult, it's a very difficult shot, but some people are talking about it and some are advocating it. Yeah. Santiago, you wanna say anything about the j yeah, very, jurisprudence? Very, very briefly, uh, regarding uh, you know, the, the prevention and uh, I, you know, as Alejandro said, uh, um, the training not might, not uh, might always work as we want, but uh, definitely it's important to train the military in every case in every country in, in Latin America. Uh, might not get all the results you want, but it's extremely important to do that. Uh, and many governments do it. And and again, as Alejandro said, I also participate in some of the trainings, and you get the feeling that this just you know, as you say. Pure gallery, which we are saying in, in, in French, but you know, doesn't they don't really sometimes uh, really follow up on, on what you teach them, but you have to do it now. But the issue is prevention goes beyond the training of the military on that issue because the military is not prepared for that. The issue is the role of the government, the role of the state, uh, not just only on military issues, police issues, or judicial issues, but also in other aspects of the state, with, whether it's education, whether it's health, whether it's work, that has to be present in areas of the country, again, Mexico <coughs> and other countries of Latin America, that the state is not present, that has been a structural discrimination against indigenous people, against the Afro-descendants, against the poor people for, for ages, and that is not be taken care of so you end up with a lot of uh, people that have absolutely no alternatives, as Alejandro mentioned. So the, the prevention should go, should focus on other aspects of the role of the state and not many through public policies, and not many governments do it in Latin America. And that's a fact. And while if you continue to have the level of poverty that you have in many of these areas of these countries, in spite of you know, having the richest person on the, of the world and having a very great uh, you know, economy, you're gonna end up, uh, you're gonna continue to have these problems. It's not, you're, gonna, you don't, you're not gonna resolve it. Um, <coughs> the, the question on how can you defend these uh, criminals, uh, that we, at the inter when I was with the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, we were always accused of defending the criminals. I mean, that has been uh, the, the question I have to answer uh, every day, basically. It's not defending the criminals at all. I mean, it's defending human rights and it's defending the rule of law, which is the only alternative to to resolve the, the problems of impunity and, and, and lack of the process in many countries. And you have to defend rule of law, regardless of what. I mean, that's, uh, that's I, I do, I strongly believe in that, and in the long term is the only solution you can have to, to stop impunity in many countries. Um, one quick thing regarding uh, Christina's point. Uh, you know, the, in order to have, a, I believe it's called stare diseases in, in this country, you need five cases. And there have been, I believe right now, Alejandro and Maureen probably know more about this, uh, 
two cases regarding uh, the, that you cannot uh, use military justice for human rights violations. So in that aspect, in theory, you need probably two or three more, I guess, if there are only two. What is not uh, been, uh, what is not clear yet, and is extremely important, as you know very well, is uh, the need to have uh, the victims of human rights violations to be able to have a recourse against, you know, a judiciary uh, uh, procedure to challenge the jurisdiction of the military justice. That is not, that has been no case, I believe, and that is still an issue, and that's, uh, as you know, that the right to due process for every individual, particularly the victims of human rights violations, is very important. And the, the, the messages we are getting these days is that it's not going in the right direction, and that's extremely, extremely important, and hopefully, again, because there have been decisions of the Inter-American system already, and particularly regarding Mexico, hopefully the Supreme Court will, will rule into that direction. And uh, I'm not an expert on, on the issue of uh, prohibition. Uh, you know, I have a personal opinion, under which I, I believe it might help you if you, you know, stop with the prohibition uh, to to try to um, resolve some of the problems we have. But I understand there are many uh, uh, obstacles in the way uh, on this issue, whether international issues regarding. Uh, what type of drugs and many things, so and I'm not an expert on that, but the one thing I do believe is important to, to, the, uh, to diminish a little bit the uh, horrendous human rights violations is to stop the selling of arms. I mean, the, 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 the arms that these uh, organized crimes have, uh, it's extraordinary, and, and they cross the border to buy the guns which is a different issue, right? But I, I do believe it's important to, to stop a uh, big part of the problem we are, we are seeing in Mexico and countries in Central America and many other countries. Mari? On that point, we have a petition to Obama right now on steps he could be doing to, to stop uh, arms trafficking to Mexico. Um, but <laughs> nice plug there. Uh, I, I think on, on the, the prevention and beyond the training, what we didn't talk much about is the justice system or police reform or even accountability within the military. I think until we have that, where you actually have strong both internal affairs units within the police, more than the military internal affairs units, where you have an effective justice system that's actually able to prosecute both crimes but also then human rights violations, because even, even within the system right now, if you're police abuse, you know, internal affairs can sanction the police, but if it's a criminal case, then we need to go to the attorney general's office. And so until you actually have a stronger justice system, I think you're not going to have the right message being transmitted to violators in terms of state agents of you're going to be held responsible for what you're doing. And I think that's the, the big issue here. It's not just training. And even I think it's not just reforming military jurisdiction, which we certainly think is an important issue. It's then how do you strengthen Mexico's institutions? How do you strengthen the civilian justice system so it actually can handle all these cases? Because unfortunately, for as opaque and lack of transparency the military system has, and I think that is where you see the civilian system as being better, it's not that we can say that there's been a st stellar performance or even very many success stories, where even in terms of human rights prosecutions, where you've seen cases move forward. So I think that's the other big challenge, both for advocates and I think particularly in terms of the human rights community, making that focus more on how do you strengthen Mexico's institutions so they can actually you know, respect the rule of law and, and do do justice on cases. Um, and I think on, certainly in terms of brutal acts of drug traffickers, no one, I think no one would defend them. I think it's also that they need to be criminally prosecuted, which is again going back to these weaknesses within the, the system. I also think that there are focuses now, both on the security experts' point of view, but even I think the incoming president-elect of Peña Nieto of looking at violence reduction, or are there strategies to really try to deter these brutal levels of violence and making it sort of not acceptable to be able to do these types of brutal actions and, and with, with impunity, but also as kind of the, the modus operandi right now of, of organizations. Um, on the Supreme Court decision, I think there was a question there about the Rosendo Radilla case and why that wasn't uh, legally binding. And from what my understanding is that case was the Supreme Court of Mexico deciding on its obligations to inter-American court decisions and that they were binding and that that would look at military jurisdiction not being applicable for human rights violations, but because it wasn't an individual case where the court was determining on a specific case of 
a Mexican soldier at the time, you know, like on human rights violations, it wasn't, it wouldn't be added to the docket of cases that are needed to establish legal jurisprudence in Mexico, which again is five cases, and that's where they're going through right now. Four more, Four more I think, because one of them yesterday was more on, whether, yesterday's decision was more, I think the military can, soldiers that commit criminal acts like drug organized crime, et cetera, should be tried in civilian court. So I think there's four more cases that need to be determined of specific responsibility of when soldiers commit human rights violations against civilians, they will be investigated in civilian courts. The, the issue also of victims um, being able to you know, appeal or having an amparo on cases is also in question in one of the cases that's being decided today. So I think it's an exciting time to be following that, but then also the challenge is once jurisprudence is, is set, what actually happens with the investigations, because as we've seen, even even in inter-American court rulings so far, none of the cases have actually brought um, any prosecution for for the um, state agents responsible. Um, lastly, I think uh, in terms of legalization, decriminalization, certainly the president-elect has commented on open to the debate, but certainly needs to be something done more on a regional level than anything that could be done in Mexico. And I think on that, the, the complexity of the situation in Mexico makes it very difficult to think that just focusing on decriminalization might change everything given the expansion to extortion, kidnapping, pirated goods. I mean, there's so many other aspects of the, the organized crime in Mexico, which I think goes back to it should be part of the discussion as an organization. We certainly have looked at alternatives to um, the current drug policy, but I think it also needs to look at how can we focus on the institutional aspects of Mexico that has allowed organized crime to, to flourish and looking at again the, the impunity for abuses that has allowed someone to say well if we can you know kidnap Central American migrants why don't we try kidnapping Mexican businessmen and kind of expanding because they know they won't be prosecuted so again it goes back to really looking at the institutional weaknesses in Mexico that need to be addressed if we're actually going to address the overall security situation in the country. Okay there were two questions up here and then there are two in the back uh, so why don't we, uh, Gabby, why don't you, uh, Mauricio and Joy, and then we'll, we'll take two more in the back. Uh, Rich Downey, I think, did you have your hand up, Rich? And there, there was a gentleman next to you there. I can't make it out exactly. But go ahead, Mauricio first, Joy, and then we'll go to the back. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I have uh, two very brief questions. One is uh, about the caravan of uh, Javier Sicilia. Uh, I think it is important. I would like to know your opinion about it. And Javier Sicilia and the movement for dignity and peace is now here in the United States, coming to Washington, D.C. And in Mexico, he uh, is a very important actor to change the, our point of views, not only on human rights, but on human sense and the human perception of the problem. And I would like to to ask for your opinion about it, um, especially in terms of the concern of the international network, no? which is the point that is looking this uh, in this moment this movement of for dignity and peace. The second is about the constitutional reform. We have uh, in Mexico a, a very important constitutional reform last year on human rights. It passed by. Uh, without not uh, too much attention, uh, but it was nevertheless a very important reform. I believe, but perhaps I'm wrong, that we have not to uh, wait until the uh, fifth uh, okay. sentence to apply that reform. Now in the constitutional uh, uh, text is, uh, are all the tools that we need to fight uh, in this, in this uh, space. Thank you. Hi. I'm, I'm going to stand up just because I can't see you all. Um, uh, I, I'm Joy Olson from WOLA, and um, I'm not a human rights lawyer, which will be made obvious by what I'm about to say. Um, I, I think it's obvious that organized crime is a human rights issue. I mean, if you're finding dozens of bodies in clandestine graves, you have a human rights problem. Uh, and I think we're in a situation where human rights law has not caught up to reality. Because whenever I discuss this issue with human rights lawyers, the, the response I get is that the international framework is too, you know, this is too difficult an issue. If you open up this can of worms, it's going to open up all other kinds of can of worms. It's not a good moment to have this conversation. Anyway, I, I think that uh, 
human rights law has got to uh, catch up with reality, and that um, and that that there are things that are logical and obvious that aren't necessarily in terms of of organized crime uh, being a human rights issue that that need to be dealt with within that framework, and that somehow there's got to be a th this discussion is happening within the human rights community. Where this discussion is not happening is in the legal community, and until that gap gets um, spanned. Um, this isn't going to get solved. Um, the, the second thing is, is, and related to that, is that Maureen and I just had a meeting a few weeks ago with uh, um, human rights organizations from all over Mexico about dealing with human rights in the context of organized crime. And one of the huge challenges, which Maureen alluded to, is that there, these local organizations are sitting on a tremendous amount of information that they can't use because, uh, because by presenting cases to state governments, uh, they are basically, they know because they know who's in these offices. I mean, they know who people are and who's connected to who and uh, in the organized crime context. And they know that in, in certain places that presenting cases to the state is presenting them to the criminals. Uh, and how do you keep uh, the victims and the human rights defenders safe in that context? And Part of the discussion was, well, what do we do about this? And then, and, but the more I've thought about this whole conversation after leaving that meeting, the more I've been thinking, why is it the responsibility of the human rights community to figure out how the state should present, per, create an environment in which even you know, information about crime can be presented to the state? This is a state responsibility. It goes back to this issue of this, this is a human rights issue, and it is the role of the state to be trying to figure this out. Rich, do you want to? Uh, Rich Downey from the Center. A quick comment and, uh, and a question. I feel obligated to say something about the issue of human rights training. As somebody who's been uh, deeply involved in training, uh, human rights training for not only Mexicans but throughout the region, uh, I'm sure Alejandro is right in that there are those for whom it makes no difference. You can train them and they will do but I think Santiago is also right, you know, and when we're talking about soldiers, for example, uh, who are trained to say, to obey the or their officers, they think it is their duty. You, uh, you beat that person, you kill that person, you rape that woman. Uh, it's his duty to do that. And, and through this training, they learn that, look, that is an illegal order. You do not... Uh, it, it is it is illegal to obey such an order, and that person is uh, is doing the illegal act. Your officer, your sergeant, and I think it's very important for people to know that. And again, there are those for whom it will make a difference. The conviction rate, as Maureen mentioned, is so low in Mexico, for example, less than two percent. But I would rather that those people hear that because that's the, oftentimes the only place they will hear that message. So, um, but anyway, that. Uh, that comment, but anyway, the, the uh, question for Maureen was uh, Rich, can you change that mic, Gabby, oh. can you give her the other mic, because oh, that keeps going in and out. Okay, sorry. Uh, thank you. And Maureen, I, I think the point you raised about the issue of the, com uh, the complexity of this collusion between state and organized crime and how difficult it is uh, to address this issue because of just overall impunity. Uh, but could you talk about some of the programs that your organization and others may be doing to address that with a human rights focus? Thank you. And then there was, uh, I believe, a gentleman. I'm sorry if I'm not, or, or a woman next to you there. Hi. My name is Emma Graya. I am Mexican. My whole family lives in Mexico. And I'm really very uh, sad about what's going on because my city is Jalapa, Veracruz. The governor doesn't even live in that city anymore because it's so violent, a city that was never violent. In Mexico, we had a say, la corrupción somos todos. We are all corrupt. It goes from the people who are selling chiclets in the streets to the people who are all the way to the top. The problem with denouncing human rights violations is that you don't know who you are going to denounce them to because you might be denouncing them to the wrong person. And every time you denounce something, you might be exactly opening a can of worms. 
you will be the person who's going to be persecuted, the victim. And this is what we are seeing in Mexico, and I don't think there's going to be any change. And unless we all take up to the streets and we demand that the people we are paid to serve as governors do the right thing, nothing is going to change. We all need to change because our politicians are some of the most corrupt people in the country. Thank you. I'm sorry that we're running out of time, so I'm going to just ask our panelists to make whatever brief comments or responses you want to make, and, uh, and I apologize for that. Thank you, ma'am, for sharing uh, and reminding us of how personal this is. Well, just, just a very brief comments. Yes, the, the Sicilia movement has been very important, and, it, and it, what is important about it is that it has been taking up the language of human rights which security-oriented organizations in Mexico don't have. You know all this, Mexico Unido Contra la Delincuencia, and uh, maybe even uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Martí, and so on. They don't have a human rights language, and the, and the, and the Sicilia movement does. So that's, that's very important because it's linking the two agendas, and they have to be linked. Um, <clears throat> but still, I think that it is, it is not a human rights movement still. Even if it has that language, it is not. I mean, that's not the main focus of its discourse or of its frame. Its frame. How, how do you frame the situation? Um, but, well, uh, uh, I'm not an expert on Sicilia, so probably I'm wrong. And, uh, and yeah, the constitutional reform is very, very important, but it's going to take time to trickle to the judge in the uh, secret, circuit court in Jalapa or in Yajalón, Chiapas to, 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 to uh, I, this is a very old anecdote, but uh, I think it's still valid. And I remember uh, in the uh, mid-1990s, uh, we were presenting a case in a, in a local, well, not a local, a state court in, in Chiapas, and part of the allegations were making reference to international instruments that Mexico have ratified. And the judge said publicly, what are you talking about? This doesn't exist. This, what is, what is this treaty? Oh, come on, yeah, the treaty exists. No, it doesn't exist because I don't know about it. <laughs> no? So it's going to take time to trickle down to the, I mean, we have, a, uh, the, the, the good news in this sense is that, that the Supreme Court and its current president, the current president of the Supreme Court is very pro rights and pro-international and, he, and he's pro these international instruments and so that but it's going to take time to to trickle down i think you know, for, to the officer on the street and the judge in the in taking the specific uh case and um and i th yeah and then going back to or just making a quick comment about joy's point i think that human rights the human rights movement should be more explicit and more active in presenting the violence in general as a human rights problem. I think they're very cautious. I mean, they have their, their, their of course, I mean, the, the, the danger they would face or the dangers they face are, so probably it's unfair for me to say it, you know, because I'm not, there, I'm not in their shoes, I'm just an academic. Uh, but, um, but probably the case should be stated more explicitly and loudly that those are human rights, it's a, that it is a human rights problem. And um, and I guess I'd stop there, yeah. Yeah, thanks. <coughs> also very, uh, very brief. Uh, um, regarding the Javier, Javier Cecilia movement, uh, I think he's doing a, an extraordinary job to raise the attention of uh, the national community and international community regarding the atrocities that are taking place in Mexico, and that in itself is, is of ex extraordinary value. Uh, there are thousands of examples of uh, how, how societies have changed thanks to the role of uh, internal civil society movements all, all over Latin America. We have seen that along the history. And in that respect, what it does help uh, all these governments is the international uh, cooperation as well as uh, 
the you know the pressure on governments to follow up on what these civil societies are, are doing. I mean, the cases of the Southern Con and the fight against uh, the dictatorships, it was created in civil society. And, and, uh, it was, and after the civil society mobilized and told the world what was going on, international community came in and, and supported that idea. And that's what he's doing. And also I think it's important because it's the fight, although it's, it's not put in the framework of you know, legally what we talk about human rights, um, it is the fight of millions of, of people all over Latin America regarding dignity. That's a, it's a very basic idea and, and a very logical one. So it's, you know, and, and he's really leading the movement and I think it's a, it's a extraordinary uh, opportunity to make real changes. Uh, constitutional reform is gonna take a, a long, long time. I, I had a meeting with, a, you know, once they made a change, a, a government official asked, uh, well, when I was at the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, Human Rights asked me for the support of the commission to to do to train judges, and I said, "Of course, we are you know 100% uh, on your side to do the training. So how how many trainings do you want?" He answered like 1,700. I don't remember. I'm more used to you know one or two trainings, and he said, "You know, and this is going to take forever." Of course, we are helping. You know, the commission is helping, <coughs> but it's going to take forever. Um, but it's extraordinary. It is an extraordinary change, and it's, it's, a, it's a pattern that we have seen in other countries in Latin America, where international human rights treaties and standards uh, are obligation for the uh, internal churches. Hopefully, this country one day will do the same. I just want to add that. <laughs> that's, that's important. Um, then, uh, regarding uh, you know, Christina mentioned before that you have you have to have another panel to discuss the constitutional changes, and I will add another panel, which is a choice uh, question, which is uh, human rights and, and uh, non-state actors and organized crime. Uh, I'm probably one of those that, from a legal point of view, believe that it's still human rights is still state. You know, w when the state violates human rights, it's the state that violates human rights, and, uh, and it's important to keep that state responsibility at the highest level. That doesn't mean that you cannot have non-state actors that also violate what we understand as a concept of human rights, but the, at the end of the day, the state should be responsible. And somewhat, some way you answered the same thing with your second point, when you said you know, how to defend these human rights de uh, defenders, how to help them. Uh, and you said, well, at the end of the day, why should we be thinking about that? It should be the state responsible for that. And it's th that. I mean, the state should still have the highest responsibility. It, it is still, in most countries, in all countries, the most powerful entity. And it's the one responsible for, for, for the killings, for the massacres, for avoiding those killings and those massacres, and for, um, and, and, and for the problem of impunity that we have in most countries. So I still believe that the, the, although the door is open for accepting non-state uh, non actors as responsible for human rights violations, at the end of the day, we need to make sure that the responsible one and the one that has to lead the changes in order to avoid more, more human rights violations is the state. Um, because, it's, because it's the one that can make the constitutional changes in order to have a, a less impunity and so on. Um, I guess that's, you know, the you know, military training, you know, I, I agree, is, is important. You know, it's, you know, uh, and uh, that's it. Thank you. Just briefly on the, the Peace Caravan, WOLA, as many as well as other organizations here in Washington are actually working on putting together the, the agenda for the Peace Movement's caravan here. It's September 10th through the 12th. I think we're supportive of the U.S. caravan in terms of the opportunity to bring that human face to, of the violence, the victims of just violence in Mexico to the United States to sort of change even, I think, the, particularly if you look at mainstream media coverage of the situation in Mexico is all drug related, these are all criminals, this is all like a war next door to looking at, this is a very human situation where you have, a, I think a lot of the victims that are here are the family members have disappeared and I think hearing about their challenges, how they've had to become their own investigators almost and prosecutors because there hasn't been that response from the state. So I think it is, it's a very powerful message. I think it's important that it's a message that they're bringing to 25 cities in the United States over the next month. And, and I think it is, again, where it isn't necessarily 
as part of the human rights movement, but I think the demands for justice are, are similar and the demands to end impunity are, are very much the, the same as what you would share from the human rights point of view. Um, on the, the military and impunity, I mean, we certainly also would think that training has its purpose. Um, what are we doing to address impunity? Boy, if we were that powerful, it'd be great to, to do more. I think, well, it, obviously this organization is, is limited, but I think some of the important things are supporting the justice reform that's happened in Mexico. I think that was a historic reform that happened in 2008. It does have the possibility if fully implemented and implemented well to really start addressing some of the issues of the widespread impunity in Mexico. States that have actually started to implement the reform are showing better results, are actually showing better prosecution rates, having public defenders and prosecutors actually appear at court hearings. I think mean, it's a big, huge endeavor, but I think that's one of the big areas where there is that need for more support, more pressure on the Mexican government, more even I think the United States has been supportive of that through USAID of pushing forward that reform is one of the one area where you really would need to address impunity. And obviously the other is denouncing abuses, keeping up that that direct pressure on the Mexican government for the widespread um, impunity in, of particularly human rights violations, but also just common crime in, in Mexico. From there. I want to tell you about three events that we have coming up, but, but before I do that, I want to thank our panelists, and please join me in thanking them for this wonderful discussion. Alejandro in particular, thank you so much. Um, if you're interested in this issue of human rights, I, we don't usually plan it this way, but we have three more events in the next few weeks, all related in some way to the human rights uh, question in, in, in Mexico. On, on September uh, 5th, uh, the president of the National Human Rights Commission in Mexico, Dr. Plasencia, will be here to speak on, on from his perspective on human rights, uh, September 5th. On September 11th, um, we have opened up our space for Javier Cecilia, uh, and uh, uh, Wola and uh, Sergio Aguayo, who's a member of our advisory board, uh, and some of the victims to talk about uh, their experiences. As Mauricio said, this is a very important expression of what's going on in Mexico. And then uh, related to that as well, on the 14th, later that week, we're going to have a screening of a, of a documentary called Reportero, about the Zeta magazine, not the Zeta human, uh, criminal group, but the magazine in Tijuana that suffered tremendous violence and has a lot to do with uh, freedom of expression, the role of the, the, the uh, journalism in Mexico. So I hope you could join us as well on the 14th uh, on that issue as well. So thank you all very much, and thanks again to the panel.